Welcome to the Live Free, Love Life podcast, where we discuss how to create more freedom so we can love our lives no matter what we're going through. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Live Free, Love Life. Today, we're talking about five emotions that keep you stuck. And of course, we will also give you a roadmap to freedom from those emotions. We all experience difficult emotions from time to time. It is a normal part of being a human. However, sometimes we can get stuck indulging in emotions that hold us back rather than moving us forward. We can indulge in any emotion. So anger, for example, is not an indulgent emotion. Anger can be extremely useful in giving us messages and in helping us move forward. But we all know people who indulge in anger. They are angry all the time. They are stuck in anger. Their anger is keeping them from moving forward. So any emotion we can indulge in. But there are emotions that we call indulgent emotions because they pretty much always keep us from moving forward and are very rarely useful. Some of the most common indulgent emotions are worry, overwhelm, confusion, self-pity, and doubt. These emotions keep us trapped in negative thought patterns and actions that limit our freedom and prevent us from living the life we truly want. Today, we will explore those five common indulgent emotions, how to identify when you're indulging in them, and then some tips for freeing yourself so you can reclaim your freedom and take steps toward the life you desire. So what are the steps to free yourself? Before looking at specific indulgent emotions, let's discuss the steps to free yourself from any indulgent emotion or even any emotion you find yourself indulging in. Step one, get curious. Our brains often use indulgent emotions to cover up something else we don't want to feel, like fear, shame, or sadness. So the first thing we want to do is to see if that's the case. Ask yourself questions like, What am I avoiding? What is underneath this? What is my brain trying to protect me from? So here's an example. If you feel confused about what to do next, confusion is an indulgent emotion. It happens to be my brain's favorite indulgent emotion. So if you're feeling confused about what to do next, it might be because you're afraid that you're going to fail. So your brain thinks it's easier and safer to feel confused than to feel fear or to take the next step and possibly feel inadequate or rejection. If you are willing to feel these emotions, if you're willing to feel fear, if you're willing to feel inadequate, if you're willing to feel rejection, then there's no reason to be confused. Confusion is just a distraction, your brain's way of avoiding something else. So our first step, get curious. We want to see what could be. There's not always, but often there is something underneath. Your brain is keeping you stuck in this indulgent emotion because something out there is scary. Usually another emotion that we don't want to feel. So step two is to process whatever was underneath. As we get curious and we find, oh, the reason I'm indulging in confusion is because X, Y, Z. Now let's go do the work on X, Y, Z. Let's go feel that feeling. Let's go look at the thoughts creating that feeling. Let's work through what's really going on for you rather than using your indulgent emotion to hide from it. We're going to actually look at what's going on. And that step two could be multiple other processes, the things that we do with our thoughts and emotions. So make sure you're listening to all of the podcast episodes to get more information about what to do there. But we do want to then go work on the actual work. The indulgent emotion, whatever it is, is a distraction from that. So once we get curious, we figure out what that is. Step two, go do the work. Step three is to take action and follow your indulgent emotion protocol. I have an indulgent emotion protocol for each indulgent emotion. A protocol is simply a process or a procedure that I follow when I notice a particular indulgent emotion showing up. A lot of our indulgent emotions are habitual. So we may only have to do step one and two once or twice, a few times. We really do the work. And then after that, 
we can often just skip to step three because we know exactly what is going on. We're like, oh yeah, this is the part where my brain makes me feel confused so I don't go do this thing and I feel rejection or I feel failure or I feel whatever. We've done the work in step one and two. We already know we're very clear about what's going on. And so we can just skip right to step three, which is just to follow our protocol. These indulgent emotions, they keep us stuck. Our brains really want to be there. They want to stay there. So following a protocol can get you unstuck much faster and much easier and have you moving forward much more quickly. For each of the indulgent emotions we're going to talk about today, I will give examples of things you could include in your protocol. Your protocol may include just one action, or it could be a combination of actions. I'm going to give you several ideas for each. So what you're going to want to do is try each of them and then come up with your own ideas, things that I haven't listed, things that you think, oh, you know what I think could be helpful with this is this. Go try that also until you have a protocol that is specifically tailored for your brain. You don't have to do one for every indulgent emotion because there may be some indulgent emotions that your brain really doesn't indulge in. We want to start with your brain's favorite, the one it goes to the most often. And then anytime you notice other ones coming up, we want to just stop and create a protocol for each of those so that we are free to create, to live our lives the way we want to, to be experiencing life on the level that we want to all the time. That's what this podcast is about, is creating freedom. Anytime we're stuck, we're not free. And these indulgent emotions keep us stuck. So we want to have a protocol for each one. So let's just review those really fast again. Step one, get curious, see what's underneath. Step two, work on what's underneath. Actually face the thing that your brain is trying to hide from. And step three is to take action, which is follow your indulgent emotion protocol. All right, the first indulgent emotion we're going to talk about is worry. Worry is defined as excessive thought and feeling of apprehension and distress. When we worry, we become consumed by fearful thoughts about potential negative outcomes. Our mind races as we try to prepare for and prevent bad things from happening. And the interesting thing about this is it never actually prevents bad things from happening. Worry is never useful. That is why it is an indulgent emotion. It does not stop the things from happening. It just takes you away from your life, from the present. You may be indulging in worry if you feel anxious or nervous frequently, have difficulty relaxing or enjoying the present moment, catch yourself playing out worst case scenarios, or obsess over things you can't control. Worry traps you in an endless loop of what ifs. So here are some break-free protocol ideas. You can call these your break-free protocols, which is fun. You could also call it your indulgent emotion protocol. You could call it your worry protocol, whatever you want. Here are some break-free protocol ideas. Number one, answer the what ifs. Unanswered questions in our brain feel big and ominous, much scarier than they actually are. It feels like the boogeyman. When you answer those questions, every single what if your brain offers you, you take their power away. Keep asking, and then what? Until the answer is some version of, I'll be okay. Idea number two, make a, this is what I call a hurricane checklist. It's not actually about a hurricane. It's just the visual that I want you thinking of. Imagine you lived in a hurricane zone. No amount of worrying will stop a hurricane from coming. You cannot control mother nature. But what you can do is everything in your power to prepare for it. Focus on what you can control. Make a list of everything you can actually do in regard to whatever it is that you are worried about. Do those things. Check everything off the list. Then, when your brain wants to worry, remind your brain that you cannot control hurricanes and you've already done everything you can do. Idea number three, bring your focus back to the present moment. Worry is generally about something that may happen or could happen in the future. If your brain is in the future, you aren't present in the present. Bring yourself back. Purposely focus on whatever is in front of you at this exact moment. Let go of trying to predict or prevent theoretical outcomes. Idea number four. 
practice mindfulness techniques like meditation to calm your anxious mind. Now, again, this is not an extensive or exhaustive list. These are just some ideas of things that you may want to try and include in your worry protocol if your brain likes to worry. Indulgent emotion number two is overwhelm. Overwhelm is a feeling of being emotionally or mentally strained beyond your coping capacity. You have so much coming at you that you can't process it all. Your to-do list seems never ending. Just thinking about everything you need to get done sends you into a tailspin. Clues that you may be indulging in overwhelm include feeling drained, exhausted, or burned out, difficulty concentrating or making decisions, avoiding responsibilities because they seem too daunting, constantly complaining about having too much on your plate, procrastinating, spending lots of time playing on your phone, watching Netflix, or other mindless activities. Here are some break-free protocol ideas. Number one, break big tasks into bite-sized steps and then focus on only the next step, just one step at a time. Idea number two, prioritize what truly requires your attention right now and focus on, again, only one thing at a time. So prioritize your list and then just focus on one at a time. Number three, decide what enough is. Do that and let it be enough. Let me explain this. When I coach my clients, so often when I ask them what enough is, they have no idea what enough would be, what their brain would actually be satisfied with. And what I notice is when we haven't defined it, enough becomes like the horizon. You move towards it and it moves. You never, you cannot ever actually reach the horizon. And if you have not defined what enough is, that is generally what I see happen in people's brains. If we haven't decided, then it's like the horizon and we can't ever actually get there. So one way to combat overwhelm is to decide what enough is and then do that and let it be enough. And anything else you do, is just a bonus. My enough bar is set really low because I love racking up bonuses. If I just do this, I'm deciding it's enough. You have to believe that it's enough. But then I usually don't stop there. I am a type A personality. I'm a go-getter. I like to get things done. I usually do a lot more than what I have decided is enough. And then it feels so fun because I'm like, not only did I do enough, I did this and I did this and I did this. And it becomes much more fun. All right, idea number four. Delegate or outsource tasks and add items to your not-to-do list. You may have too many things on there. I did an episode a few weeks ago. Go back and listen to that about the not-to-do list. Put things on there. Stop saying yes to everything. And idea number five is to re-decide. Just because you already said yes, that doesn't mean you can't change your mind. Look for things you may want to change your mind about and take off your plate. And then make a list of things that you want to say no to in the future. Again, not an extensive list. Add more ideas of your own. When you feel overwhelmed, especially if your brain's favorite indulgent emotion is overwhelm, and you know exactly what's going on. You've done step one and step two. You've done the work. You're like, oh yeah, my brain loves to hide from this emotion by using overwhelm. And you notice the overwhelm and you're like, oh, I see what you're doing, brain. You're just trying to avoid this. I've already done that work. I already know that that's not a problem. I don't need to do step one and two. Here's my protocol. Here is what I will do when I feel overwhelmed to get myself out of it quickly, efficiently, so that I'm not trapped. I'm not stuck in overwhelm. Overwhelm loves to keep us stuck. And generally, what I notice with most of my clients is when they feel overwhelmed, they are either not doing anything or they're distracting themselves with things that they don't actually care about, like the playing on the phone. That's not what they really want to be doing with their time, but they do a lot of it when they feel overwhelmed and they aren't doing the things they really want to do. They aren't living the life they really want to live. They're creating the things they really want to create. They aren't accomplishing the goals they really want to accomplish. Overwhelm takes away our freedom. All the indulgent emotions do because they keep us stuck and not moving forward. So these are just some ideas to try for your 
overwhelm protocol. But this is key. You have to find a protocol that works for you, for your brain, for your personality, for your lifestyle. That's why these are just ideas. Everyone will have their own protocol for each of the indulgent emotions. All right, the next one is confusion. Confusion is a state of being puzzled or baffled. When you're confused, you lack clarity and direction. Ambiguous situations leave you doubting yourself and uncertain about what to do next. You may be indulging in confusion if you frequently feel perplexed or unable to make sense of things. You struggle with indecision or delay making choices. This is the one I see most often. You tend to be unclear about your purpose or goals. You have difficulty focusing because your mind feels foggy. Emerging from confusion requires proactivity. Do not sit around waiting for clarity to strike. Here are some break-free protocol ideas for confusion. Number one, write a list of everything you do know. This is how I started my confusion protocol. The first time I started working on this, I just thought every time I notice that I'm feeling confused because my brain loves to feel confused, and I already know what it's hiding from. It's usually something about putting myself out there and failing or rejection or inadequacy or not being loved or something. Um, I've already done the work. I'm not hiding from that anymore. I just noticed my brain doing it. The first thing I started on my confusion protocol was just write a list of everything that I do know. Because my brain kept saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I wrote a list of everything I knew. And it was actually a lot more than I was giving it myself credit for. And then I did the second thing, which was write a list of everything you need to learn, then make a plan to learn those things. It might include research, education, expert advice, schedule it in your calendar. So at first I wrote a list of everything I knew. And then I was like, here's what I actually still don't know. I'm not making up a story that I don't know it. I actually don't know it. For example, I don't know how to build a website. I actually don't know that because I'd never done it before. But sitting around telling myself that I don't know how to do it is not helpful. It keeps me stuck. It does not help me move towards creating a website. But what does is making a plan of all the things I need to learn and how I'm going to learn them and then scheduling them on my calendar. Once I did that, once I made the plan, I schedule it. I didn't need to feel confused anymore because not knowing something wasn't a problem. I wasn't confused about it. I just didn't know some stuff, but I'm going to learn the stuff. Idea number three, rather than trying to know and understand the big picture, get clear on just the next step and do that, knowing that the next step will give you more data to get clarity on the one after that. So let me give you a visual. This actually works really well for overwhelm also. So if your brain tends more towards overwhelm than confusion, feel free to use this visual because it works really well for both. It just depends on where your brain likes to go. Imagine you're going to drive from New York City to LA. If you don't live in the United States, you're not familiar with the map, this is on complete ends of the country. We're going to drive from one end of the country to the other end of the country. It's going to take a long time, a lot of hours. And what we're probably going to do is we're going to put our address into Google Maps or your map of choice. And we're just going to look at the map and it's going to say, in 17 miles, turn right. And that's really all we need to know. We don't need to know uh, when we're going to get off to get gas in Missouri. We don't need to know that. We don't even know all the things we're going to come across. Our path may look one way as we start, but then there's construction or there's an accident and our map is going to reroute us. We can't possibly know how we're going to get from point A to point B every single step all the way along the way before we actually do it. We have to just do the thing. If I just start following the map and then 17 miles, I turn right, like it says, the moment I do that, the map's going to tell me the next step. So often when we are either feeling confused or overwhelmed, we're trying to know that whole entire path and we just can't. But we do know the next thing. And once we do that, it's going to give us information about the next thing. And that will give us information about the next thing. Don't let your brain get caught in the whole entire map. Brain, we don't need to know all those things. We just need to know the next step. I actually do know the next step. I know exactly what that is. I'm not confused about the next step. I'm confused about the whole entire journey. So one of the ideas you go put on your protocol is focusing on just the next step and stop trying to think about the whole entire journey because then we are indulging in confusion or possibly overwhelmed, depending on how your brain works. 
Okay, the next idea for confusion. Reflect on your values and your why to reconnect with your purpose. Sometimes we just get so lost in the everyday, the nitty gritty, the details that we forget why we're doing it. We forget our purpose. We forget our values. And that's why we become confused. We're not really sure what we're doing or why. So another idea, and this could be the main reason that your brain goes into confusion, get reconnected with that, with your values, with your purpose, with your why. And that can get you out of confusion quickly. The next idea, thing to try, just make a decision. Use your best judgment, knowing what you know right now, and then course correct as you go. It's okay to make a decision and then course correct. Remember our GPS, it does it all the time. When I start, my map says I'm going one way and then it course corrects. It's not a problem. If we make a wrong turn, my map reroutes me all the time. Every time I go the wrong way. Just make a decision and start moving forward. Sometimes that is what gives us the clarity that we were looking for. Sometimes moving forward is the only way to get it. So we sit here and we indulge in confusion, waiting for the answer. We want to be clear on it first, but often moving forward is the only way to get it. So one fun idea for your confusion protocol is just make a decision. Just take action. Just take a step. Just move forward because that may be exactly what you need to get the clarity you're looking for. All right. Our next indulgent emotion is self pity. Self-pity is excessive, self-absorbed unhappiness over your current state. You feel victimized by your circumstances and dwell on your struggles and misfortunes. It's a form of self-centeredness dressed up as despair. Signs that you might be indulging in self-pity include frequently complaining about how difficult your life is, comparing yourself to others and feeling like you got the short end, making statements like nothing ever goes my way, fishing for validation from others by emphasizing your hardships. Here are some break-free protocol ideas. The antidote to self-pity is gratitude. So write a list of everything you're grateful for or purposely look for the positives in each situation that you're feeling self-pity about. You can do it on a general scale. You can do it on a very specific scale. Find ways to create gratitude because it is the antidote to self-pity. Idea number two, change your perspective. Here are a few of my favorite questions to help with this, with self-pity specifically. How is this fair? Often when we are feeling self-pity, we're thinking it's not fair. So really go there. How is it fair? One of my favorite things to use for this is I choose to believe that everyone got the exact set of awesome things and hard things. We got the exact set of things for our specific journey. So whereas for one person, having cancer is the very best thing for them on their journey to become who they're destined to be, to become the very best version of themselves. That could be, it doesn't look fair It looks terrible. Why does this person have to have cancer and this person doesn't? Does it look fair? But what if each of our things were designed specifically for us for our very best good? That would make all of it fair because it's all designed very specifically for each person so they can reach their highest, truest potential. Just something to consider. The next question is, how is this happening for you? It's along the similar lines, right? So how is it fair? How is it happening for you, meant to you, for you? How might this be happening for your very best good? How could this be the best thing that could happen to you? Something to consider. Another question. What do you want or need that you're not giving to yourself? And then give it to yourself. Really think about that question. Sometimes we're in self-pity because we're just not actually fulfilling our own needs or our own desires. And we're seeing other people have those things, but it's our responsibility to give it to ourselves. One easy way to get out of that is to consider what that is and then give it to ourselves. And the last break-free protocol idea for self-pity is to be your own best cheerleader. Give yourself the pep talk you need right now. I love Mel Robbins' uh, high five habit, giving yourself a high five in the mirror every morning. Maybe when you're feeling self-pity, that could be something that works for you. You go and give yourself a high five in the mirror 
Give yourself a little pep talk. Be your own cheerleader. Our next indulgent emotion is doubt. Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty about yourself, your abilities, or your decisions. You question your capability to take on challenges. Nagging what-ifs plague you. Imposter syndrome creeps in as you wonder if you're good enough. Signs of indulging in doubt include downplaying your skills or talents, letting the fear of failure hold you back from pursuing goals. This is the one I see a lot. Having an inner critic that constantly second guesses you. All you Enneagram ones, this might be one of your brain's favorite indulgent emotions. And minimizing your potential by thinking, I can't do this. Learning to manage doubt takes self-compassion. Recognize that doubt is normal, but don't let it dictate your self-worth. Here are some break-free protocol ideas. One, write a list of your past successes. Include big and small successes. Include everything you did that you had never done before. Because this is one of the things I see so often with my clients. They don't think they can do it because they haven't done it before. But you know how many things that you've done in your life that you hadn't done before? Like walking, talking, reading, spelling, math learning to drive. There's so many things that you've done in your life that you had never done before. So thinking I can't do it because I've never done it before, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Write a list. If you're feeling doubt, if you're feeling like you can't do something, and maybe especially because you haven't done it before, write down all those things, all of the big successes, all of the small successes, all of the successes in between, everything you did that you had never done before, write it all down. Show your brain, hey, I can probably do it. I've done all these things. Why am I choosing to think I can't do this? Number two, write down your skills and strengths. Really focus on what you are good at. What makes you special? What are the things that you're good at that you didn't even know was a skill or strength because you've always been naturally good at it? But other people look at you and they think, man, I wish I was good at that. Write them all down. If you have to, go take some of those tests that show you, like the strengths finders. Go take one of those tests and show you what your strengths are. And then go write them down and look at them. And remember how awesome you are. Help you get out of doubt. Number three, consider the opposite. So yes, you might fail, but you also might succeed. Yes, this could go terribly, but also it could go wonderfully. Give the positive side of the equation equal airtime. This could just be your protocol every time you feel doubt. You just say, yes, brain, and this is also true. This could also happen. It could also go this way. Yes, and equal airtime. Number four, make peace with worst case scenario. What is the worst thing that could happen if you move forward? So what? Why is that so terrible? Generally, when we're afraid we can't do something, we're afraid of how we're going to feel because that's the reason we do or don't do anything is because of emotions. Maybe if we think we can't do it and we try, maybe we're afraid of feeling uh, embarrassed or humiliated or rejection or inadequate, whatever that emotion is. So what? What is so terrible about feeling embarrassed? Why is this even a problem? Make peace with feeling that feeling so that when your brain's like, I can't do that because then I could feel this. You're like, so what? We could just go feel that. What's the problem, brain? And number five, choose to be childlike. Toddlers do not doubt their ability that they can do something, even if they haven't done it before. They just do it. And they don't make it mean something about themselves when they fail. They just keep trying until they figure it out. Choose to believe in yourself the way a toddler does. Just put yourself into that mindset. If I was just learning how to walk, what would I be thinking right now? I've never walked before. Remember, when we watch these toddlers, they're not beating the crap out of themselves because they tried to to walk and they couldn't and they fell down. They don't do that. What if we did that? What if we just chose to be childlike in that way? We chose to go after and do things that we've never done before. And we still believe in ourselves. It doesn't matter if we've never done it before. We just choose to believe in ourselves like a toddler does. Okay, that is the five most common indulgent emotions that I see with my clients over and over again. Here are some questions to consider. As you listen to this, as you maybe go back and re-listen, what is your brain's favorite indulgent emotion? Let's figure that out. 
In what kinds of scenarios does your brain choose indulgent emotions? What emotions does your brain like to cover up with indulgent emotions? What emotions does your brain like to avoid by distracting you with indulgent emotions? So sometimes we're feeling something now and we cover it up with the indulgent emotion. Or there's something that we could feel in the future. And so we distract ourselves over here with our indulgent emotion. They're kind of different things, but they're both about just avoiding emotion. And number five, what will it take to stop indulging in these emotions? Go back through and listen again. Where does your brain like to go? What are some things that you might like to try as you set up a protocol? What do you think your brain is trying to avoid? And what's so scary about just feeling the real thing instead of covering it up with the indulgent emotion? At times, we all indulge in emotions that don't serve our highest good. Let's not use this as a reason to beat the crap out of, our, out of ourselves. We do enough judging of ourselves. When you notice yourself indulging in an emotion, do not use that as an excuse to judge yourself. All of us do this, all of us. The reason I recommend making a protocol is because this is not an if, it is a when. You will indulge in emotions. Whether it's these ones or whether it's others, you will do it. All the humans do it. It's not something to judge ourselves for. It's just something that we humans do. I love making the protocol because I just go, oh, I'm indulging in overwhelm. Where's my protocol? Let's just follow that. It's not a problem until you make it a problem. It doesn't mean anything about you until you make it mean something about you. The key is to become more conscious of when this happens so you can choose freedom instead. So you don't have to end up stuck in your indulgent emotion, stuck not moving forward the way you want to. Monitor your emotional patterns. Notice which indulgent emotions are your brain's favorite and why. Notice when you get stuck ruminating. Then make a deliberate shift out of the restrictive mindset that is holding you back, out of the actions that you take because you're feeling that indulgent emotion that also hold you back. Replace it with a mindset that nourishes your soul and moves you forward. And do this using that protocol. You have the power to free yourself. Live free, love life. Thank you for watching this episode of Live Free, Love Life. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to like, comment, and share. See you next time.